Welcome everybody, I'm Jason, the creator of the Tabletop Battlefield, and over the past few videos here, I've been talking about this guy, at least in part. This is my new Prusa SL1 Resin 3D printer. Now, the one thing I didn't quite mention in detail is that it took about a month in order for me to get this printer dialed in to where I can get reliable, consistent prints without failures out of it. So my hope today is that this video will keep you from having that happen to you, and you get your printer running in a, maybe a few hours. Before I dive too much into all the printer failures, I want to add one little extra safety tip on this whole setup. Now, of course, when you work with resin printers, you probably watch a bunch of tutorials. Gloves are very important, as well as when you're working with the actual resin, you want to have some goggles on, as well as respiration protection if that's required as well. Now, I extend that just a little bit, though, in the saying that whenever I'm working anywhere around here, I have my gloves on, even if in this case all the resin is put away and capped off. Because what tends to happen is this resin residue gets everywhere. It gets on your gloves and then it gets on the printers. And so in fact, on the printer here, on the front plexiglass cover, whatever this cover is made of, as well as in the CW1, I've got a thin layer of resin from all the resins on my gloves every time I open and close these things. And it's actually not even safe to touch these printers without gloves because of this. So that's why when I'm in this area in general, I always have my gloves on. I want to talk a little bit about the FEP film that's on the bottom of the resin tank. This is where I ran my first set of failures. In my actual first test print, I managed to jack up the, the film that was installed there, so I had to replace the FEP film with another one that comes with the resin printer. And if you look at the bottom of these things, there are about, I think I counted 24 screws in the case of the Prusa SL1 that are holding this film down. This is one of the things I found on the form after I had consistent failure after failure after failure. You have to make sure every single one of those screws is tightened down and tightened down all the way. And when I say tighten it all the way, I mean turn the Allen key such that you get the max amount of torque and tighten it down that way. Because if there's even a little bit of flexibility in that film in terms of things not tightened down, you will get consistent failure after failure after failure. Uh, the first whole batch of fillers that I had was because one of those screws was maybe a millimeter out of place. It wasn't tightened down a full millimeter down. And because of that, like I said, it literally every print failed. And it's only because I found this thread, not even this thread, only because I found a single post on the Prusa SL1 form I was able to move forward and at least get some prints running. So that's very important to make sure that's all tightened down. Now also, and related to that, whenever you make adjustments to the FEP film or the printer in general, be sure to recalibrate. If you don't, lots of failures. Like after I had that first situation where I had to tighten down the one bolt a millimeter, a few weeks later I went back and tightened everything down again without recalibration, total failure. All the pieces in the print failed. The FEP film probably didn't even move close to a millimeter, if not a lot less than that, but because you're dealing with tolerances and layers that are 0 0.05 millimeters, slight adjustments without recalibration results in total failure. Let's move on to talking about supports. I've got a couple empty supports right here, and no, these are not from actual miniatures I clipped off. These were from prints where the supports failed. Now, primarily I've been printing off game miniatures, in particular Legends of Caledagia miniatures, and you can learn more about that at Caladagia.com. I'll link in the show notes. That's my um, space combat miniatures game. And what I found with larger miniatures, like what the Legends of Caladagia miniatures are, is the default support settings are not strong enough for that kind of a thing. The diameter of the very tips of the supports are just not enough to get a good enough grip on decent sized miniatures to hold them in place. And what would happen is either the part of the miniature or the entire miniature would actually fall off the supports and the print would fail. And this was one of those kind of inconsistent things where I print off four of the same miniature, three might print fine, one might fail. I went into the Prusa slicer, I upped the size of the supports. You can see a screenshot of that right now. It's what I changes for I made for the smaller Caladagia miniatures and for some of the larger ones, I'm talking destroyer class, all the way up to the new Ionia class. <laughs> Follow me on Instagram if you want to see what that one was. No, just kidding, it's in the video too. 
<laughs> You're probably looking at it right now, the new um, Coast Guard Ionia class light cruiser. But um, side track there. Even for, I even had even more aggressive settings for some of the larger miniatures. Now this does cause a little bit of defects on the surface of the miniature, but a lot of that comes down to learning how to place supports, and I'm sure I'll get better at that as time goes on. I look at my notes, I'm like, oh, this one. This next issue is the one that drove me up the freaking wall for weeks after weeks after weeks. Now the Prusa S01 you see in front of you here, I'm gonna lower that thing down, it might be in my face for all I know. This one here was one of the pre-built kits. So I did not assemble this, sorry, the pre-built models. I did not assemble this myself. I got assembled at the factory and it's mailed to me in its entirety. Now the issues I was having was I'd calibrate the printer and I would get an excellent print. I'd run another print, I'd get another excellent print. Then failures would start creeping in a little bit at a time. It'd be one piece would fall off the print bed, two pieces would fall off the print bed. At one point, I printed off 18 game tokens, which for some reason look like javelin missiles from the Ergol Empire. I wonder what I'm working on there. And only six of the 18 game tokens remained attached to the printer. Now, there's all sorts of little troubleshooting you can do by following the instructions of this printer that come with it or will come online, all that kind of fun stuff. But this issue was a little bit trickier because all those things I tried and the failures kept happening after several prints. So the first I'd recalibrate, prints would succeed, then failures would start creeping in again and again and again. It wasn't the size of the miniature. First time I printed the Ionia, her main hull came out fine, which is huge. Her main gun turret, which is a lot smaller, failed. And here's what I was able to narrow it down to. The pattern I was seeing had nothing to do with like I said, the size of the miniature or whether it was hollow or not, any of that. It was the placement of the miniature and the build plate. The closer the miniature was to the front of the build plate, now I'm, what I'm talking about is the front of the build plate in terms of being closest to the front of the printer here, the um, orange plexiglass thing. The closer it was there was the more likely it was to fail. So what would happen is the failures would start in the front of the build plate and then slowly over the course of several prints would work their way backwards until eventually you get a total failure or near total failure of the print. And that kind of led me into a clue that it wasn't like a resin issue. It wasn't like a conditions issue where the printer was it was something to do where the printer was not holding its calibration because like recalibrating it would work fine. I posted this over on the Facebook group. So there is a SL1 Facebook group. It's actually really helpful. You can get some good information over there. People are very nice, very helpful. And one of the other posters noticed that they had the exact same issue I had and they had worked this issue out with proof support. And for some reason, a whole bunch of bolts or screws in the front here were not tightened down correctly. There are four screws on the front plate. Tighten those down as much as you can. Under the resin tank, there's a whole bunch of screws here. The whole, I think it's the LCD panel, I'm not entirely sure, but there's a whole bunch of screws under the resin tank. Tighten those down as much as you can. On the build plate, there's four screws that attach to the actual build plate surface and kind of clamp it in half so that I can, you can hang it up here on the top of the printer. Tighten those four screws down as much as you possibly can. Because Now what was happening is that every time the printer would print, one of those screws would not tighten down properly and the motion of the bed, because the Prusa S01 has a tilting bed where it tilts forward and back to remove things from the FPP film, each layer is printed, would slowly, bit by bit, cause the printer to come out of alignment or out of calibration such that the calibration would start to fail in the front and work its way towards the back, which would cause those progressive failures from the front all the way to the back. Ever since I tighten all those things down, I have not had a failure that I cannot attribute to an issue with the model. And I'm now on like seven, eight, nine, ten prints later, which I never got before, before I tightened those things down. So even if you got your printer from S01 fully assembled, it is the S01, if you got your printer from Prusa fully assembled, 
Be sure to tighten all those bolts down to make sure that you're going to get nice, solid, reliable prints. Now here's my last and final tip for you guys tonight. If you look at the instructions of the Prusa SO1, they recommend washing the resin tank with warm water with soap and paper towels. Now the problem with paper towels I was having is I couldn't ever get the resin tank really that clean. It was really cloudy and sometimes it was cloudier with the paper towels than when I had taken out of the printer and kind of dried it off all the resin. Another suggestion I found online, I think it was on either the Facebook group or one of the forums, was to use some sort of all-purpose micro all microfiber cloth to clean out the resin tank when you wash it and when you remove the dry up the little bit of resin that's left over after you empty the resin back into the bottles. And these things work a heck of a lot better. Uh, when I run the water over the tank and clean it out that way, the FEP film is cleaner than when I use paper towels. And these things work really, really well for sopping up the last of the resin when it's left over, like I said, after you pour the resin back into the bottles. Uh, this particular pack I got for uh, $10, there's 24 in here, and I picked this up from Home Depot here in the United States, but I imagine many stores will carry something along these lines. Now, these are in theory washable in like a washing machine, but of course, once they're contaminated with resin, they're kind of uh, toxic. Um, you probably can't toss these things, you know, in a washing machine without taking off some, you know, well, at least pushing the boundaries of environmental regulations, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. Don't do it. Um, so I haven't figured out what's the best way to clean them just quite yet, but honestly, they just keep working again and again and again. And I've used these two now for 10 prints and I haven't really had an issue in terms of too much resin getting built up on them. So... I don't know, we'll see how things go. But like I said, these things I find they work a lot better than paper towels. And some paper towels, according to Prusa, can actually scratch FEP film and damage it a lot faster than something like this probably could. So I think that's about all the information I got to share for the Prusa SO1 today. It's kind of summarizing some of the issues I've had and how I got past them. And with that, I'm actually now really happy with this printer. I was really frustrated the first month. I mean, $1,700 and this thing was just working like crap. But once I got those things sorted out, I'm really happy with it. The detail is incredible. <laughs> it's actually, I mean, I'm, I'm very impressed. Um, this thing can almost get Shapeways quality. Uh, the Caladagia miniatures for the resin and pewter miniatures I've sold in the past, those are all a um, Shapeways high quality print that I then cast in resin or pewter with, you know, two-part mold, all that fun stuff. Out of the printer, I can get prints that are almost as high quality as the original master. And because of the fact that they lack the defects and inherently get in with resin and pewter casting, they're higher quality than the resin and pewter miniatures I sell. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to slowly bit by bit here over the next few months, if year, two years, whatever it may be, convert the entire Caladagia miniature line over to resin 3D prints. Um, I'll talk more about that in a future video in terms of the economics of that. The quick off the top of my head calculations say yes, I can actually sell resin 3D prints and still make a good profit. It's similar to what I can get with um, resin and pewter miniatures, but I'll run through those numbers sometime in the not too distant future. But thank you guys all for watching. Once again, I'm Jason, the creator of the Tabletop Battlefield. If you want to see more videos about resin printing, well, subscribe to the video. No, subscribe to the YouTube channel. You know what I mean. Like, the, <laughs> just, 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 you, you, everybody, if you watch YouTube, everybody says it time and time again. And, you know, hit the like button or smash the like button. Why does everyone say smash the like button? Seriously, everybody says that. Smash the like button. It's, it's, it just seems like that's like the common thing to say. Eh, turn on notifications, all that fun stuff. But anyway, until next time, have a great week.